The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Do you feel like I do? That the end of days are fast approaching? We just feel powerless to stop the wholesale slide into global insanity. It's a tragedy that much of the institutional church doesn't have real answers for what's going on. While real born-again believers know that the Lord is refining and preparing His bride for His soon return. But those who stand for truth are now regarded as enemies of the godless world order. We just have to trust the Lord, the King of the universe, to impart to us special grace, patience, and wisdom for such a time as this. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. In my more than 40 years of ministry, I've never witnessed such mass insanity as is going on right now when people are literally calling evil good and good evil. As Bible prophecy predicted, we're living through a clash of civilizations between those who believe in the Bible and those who actively oppose this word of truth. However, the Bible foretold that the world would increase in wickedness and anarchy, leading to apostasy and the rise of the Antichrist. So should we be surprised as prophetic trends unfold? There's no doubt eventually everyone will believe the Bible on the great day of the Lord. But in the meantime, it's so dangerous to throw God out of our national life. I heard a preacher tell a story about a species of ants in Africa. The young ants and the queen are sheltered in the earth. The worker ants go back and forth from their catacomb to forage. But if the queen is molested, the workers, even from a distance, become nervous and uncoordinated. And if the queen is killed, the worker ants become frantic, rushing around aimlessly, unable to find their way back to the colony and they die. What an analogy. As soon as mankind kills off God, society becomes disoriented and frenzied, ending up in a macabre dance of death. What appears to be foolishness concerning God in the Bible is actually much wiser than human wisdom. A recent article in the Spectator magazine advocated that the Bible should be studied, not just to understand Christianity, but to help us to understand the words and ideas that have shaped our world for generations. In America, many intercessors are praying and believing for a last great spiritual awakening, while society is being manipulated with the race card, demanding that we go backwards against all progress that's been made in the past in race relations. The truth is, healing only comes through forgiveness, not through victimization and virtue signaling. It's too easy for naive people to succumb to hatred and division. But Acts 17.26 in the New Testament is an important verse stating that God has made from one blood every nation on the face of the earth. The world desperately needs this message that we're one human race with different levels of skin pigmentation, that's all. The spirit of the living God is calling believers to learn the lesson that every human being has only one color in common, red. We all bleed the same color, red. John 3:16 silences racism because it declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, by God's grace and calling, I've spent most of our productive years in our ministry in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, far away from the culture of my birth, 
My husband and I were sent by the Christian Broadcasting Network to start their news bureau in Jerusalem during the 1980s. And we've had many broadcasting experiences in Israel, in Lebanon with the Voice of Hope, and Middle East television, and all throughout Africa. One of the emphases of our ministry is 2 Corinthians 5 and verses 12 to 14. For Messiah's love compels us because we are all convinced that one died for all. And so from now on, we're going to regard no one according to the flesh because God has reconciled us to himself through Messiah. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So therefore, we're ambassadors for Messiah as though God were making his appeal to the world through us. And we implore you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. You see, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on the cross on our behalf, so that in him we might become, by transfer, the righteousness of God. When I was a young child, through being taught the Bible, God gave me a special love for the Jewish people, the people of the book. And through visions and many spirit-led experiences in the Holy Land, God also gave me a supernatural love for the Jewish half-brothers, the Arabs. And I have been busy working amongst them as a cross-cultural minister of reconciliation through preaching and Bible teachings, explaining God's eternal purposes for Israel, for the church, and the nations. The greatest blessing in the world and the hinge of history is the cross of Messiah. You see, the cross cancels the sentence of death against sinners and even cancels sicknesses if we will believe in the power of the atonement that's been made available to us in the gospel. Well, somebody wrote to me asking me to pray because a bunch of witches were going to hurl curses again against believers. But I answered what I've said many times, that years ago, I took on the mindset of one of our mentors, Reinhard Bonka, of blessed memory, that the blood of Jesus was not shed in vain and the curse undeserved cannot stick. That's Proverbs 26, 2. A curse without a cause will not come upon you. Nothing can get through the bloodline of Jesus's protection because God is in control. So let's learn to confess 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he within you than he in the world, Satan. And Isaiah 54, 17, one of my favorite go-to verses, proclaims no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue rising against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Many intercessors are fervently praying and believing that America will repent and lead the world in a great revival. But simultaneously, we're also witnessing the birth pains, the beginning of sorrows that the Bible says will precede the rapture and the glorious second coming of Jesus. Even secular people know that signs of the coming apocalypse are casting their shadows on us now. Dark Sinister forces are trying to pit Americans against one another. And many who claim great intellect just cannot reason properly. And because they believe God's word is worthless, God has given them over to a worthless reprobate mind. We need a biblical worldview and an understanding of Bible prophecy to be able to sort all the news and the misinformation that's thrown at us constantly. And we must remain calm. A genuine believer in Jesus should not be shaken by bad news and calamities. Those who believe that God is in complete control of our lives are truly set free from fear. Because we know that this present age is not the be all and end all, but that a new world order of righteousness is coming when Jesus returns. In the New Testament, a group of Galileans was killed in the temple by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate 
But Jesus calmly remarked, Do you suppose that those Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered that fate? I tell you, no, Jesus said, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or Jesus added, do you suppose that the 18 persons who were killed when a tower collapsed and fell on them were worse than all the others who live in Jerusalem? He said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus explained that some people die in accidents and some die naturally. But the bottom line is that we're all going to perish unless we're taken up in the rapture. And the main point is everybody must repent. The need of repentance is what every human being has in common. We all need the Lord's atonement, the merits of the Savior to atone for our sins. Well, this Bible has all the answers about what's going on prophetically. The New Testament forewarned that in the last days, there's going to be perilous times. And also Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. And also he said, as it was in the days of Lot, who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall conditions be when the Lord returns. Of Noah's generation, Genesis chapter 6 testifies that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so the Lord regretted that he had made man. Can we just sense the grief of God's heart now over the horrific things that are happening on a daily basis? The violence, the perversity, the depravity. And with the increasing rise of anarchy, the scriptures further foretell the rise of a governmental system that will subjugate the entire world using surveillance to control every aspect of life so that no one will be able to buy or sell without belonging to the system, lock, stock, and barrel. And once the global currency is established, the prophesied man of sin will arise. First, he'll be perceived as a man of peace, but he will soon reveal his true colors and persecute anyone who dares to defy him and still hold allegiance to God especially the Jewish people. The rise of this Antichrist, or as he's described by the Hebrew for Christians website, the Messiah of evil, will be in accordance with the vision of the prophet Daniel. You see, the angel Gabriel had told Daniel that there will be 70 weeks of years of Israelite history. And 69 of those 70 weeks of years have already been fulfilled. Presently, we're living in the church age, which is a parenthesis or a gap between Israel's 69th and final 70th week of years. But signs are increasing that the gap is closing and soon the world will experience the end time tribulation period of history, the 70th week or the last seven years of Israel's redemptive history. And as events move closer to the time of God's judgments, followers of Messiah will be forcibly removed from the earth. This is known in the New Testament as the great catching away or the rapture. Now, of course, the term rapture is based upon a word in the Latin Bible, meaning to be suddenly caught up. Then the man of sin, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many of Israel's neighbors, and he will demand worship of his image, which will be some sort of artificial intelligence as described in Revelation 13, 15. Technology will enable Antichrist to control the population. And despite the world's great technological progress, history is nevertheless in decline. Mankind is not advancing morally upward towards some sort of utopia, but is sliding downward towards a short satanic dystopia that will be ruled by a ruthless dictator. Presently, only the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is holding back the revelation of the sinister figure known in Bible prophecy as the Antichrist. Scripture says that the rapture, the great snatch, our gathering together in the clouds unto the Lord must come first. 
Then those who did not receive the love of the truth will be left behind to endure the great tribulation. It's my prayer for the gospel's sake that we can win as many souls as possible in the meantime before it's too late. May the Lord help us to live productive, holy lives as salt and light, preservatives of society, voices of hope in a world that seems to be spinning out of control. You see, ever since the original fall of the first man, Adam, history has been inexorably moving toward its culmination. Charles Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, speculated whether man was descended from some pre-existing form. And while I don't subscribe to Darwinism and the theory of evolution, it can truly be said that mankind has descended. People never truly ascend upwards unless they are regenerated, born again. And when we're born again by the Holy Spirit and by the washing of the blood of the Lamb of God, then we do ascend upward to the Father. Otherwise, unregenerate mankind keeps descending after the fall in the Garden of Eden, having first begun in the image of God, but having sunk into sin that will ultimately degenerate into the very depths of rebellion during the great tribulation prophesied in the book of Revelation. Romans 1.28 explains the reason for God's judgments and wrath. Because men, it says, did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Therefore, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That word reprobate means depraved, unprincipled, shameless. When God gives a society or a nation over to a reprobate mind, the consequence is that shameless reprobates lose the ability to judge with right judgment. Reprobate societies invent and worship their own gods and celebrate deviant sexual behavior. We really shouldn't be surprised because Jesus told us in advance that his return would be as in the days of Noah in the days of Lot. And as I said, Lot lived in a place called Sodom, synonymous with sin. Now then, As the time of the Lord's return draws nearer, it seems that people exhibit less and less wisdom. And I've been shocked by a growing, what shall we call it, insanity, unreasonable behavior and decisions calling evil good and good evil. You know the kinds of things I'm talking about and how we must maintain personal peace in a growing and traumatic world. Jesus told us to look up when these birth pains begin to happen because it means his coming is near. And furthermore, he has bequeathed his peace to us and also his presence and wisdom to help us to navigate these troublesome times. So as we see the world unraveling, it's high time to seek God with all of our hearts, to repent, to return to God, and to examine ourselves with a spiritual checkup to be sure that we're actually walking in the faith because the days are evil divisive, and deceptive. The Apostle Paul admonished us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to examine ourselves to determine whether we're still in the faith, if our faith is genuine. Don't you recognize, Paul asked, that you're people in whom Jesus the Messiah lives? Or could it be that you're failing the test, he asked. Critics were always challenging the Apostle Paul's authority and credentials. So at the close of his letter, he challenged the Corinthians to verify their own faith. The Corinthians were idolaters before they embraced the Lord. So Paul asked them to examine their belief system to see if they had really renounced all idols and debauchery and if they were putting their trust in the Lord Jesus alone. Tragically, it's certainly possible to hold to an insincere or superficial faith. And so Paul admonished the Corinthians to examine carefully their own motives and characters. And we should do the same. The commentaries explain that this self-examination implies that any professing believer should be making an open confession of the Lord. We shouldn't be ashamed to share our biblical convictions. 
and to be sure that we're walking in harmony with other genuine believers. So let's be candid and ask ourselves, do we hold a sincere, strong belief in the Lord? If the Spirit of the Lord is in us, we'll be conscious of daily communion with the Lord. His presence and promptings will keep us from leaning to our own understanding. He'll guide us and sanctify us and also comfort us. So how else do we really know that we're in the faith? Well, if the Spirit of the Lord is in you, He will definitely be uppermost in your thoughts. He'll speak to you and guide your decisions. He will prompt you to do things and to say things or to be cautious and to withdraw from certain situations as a protection. The promise of His coming will be often in our conversation. And if not, Do you really love him? Do you really know him? Does he reign in every compartment of your mind? Or do you keep him locked out of certain rooms of your heart? Well, only the soul knows the answers to these things. And the Bible says, in all of your getting, get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. You know, in today's society, people have become so degenerated and abusive to one another that Parents aren't allowed to discipline their children to correct them. But no such constraints have been put on God. He still chastises and disciplines every child of God. And the Bible teaches that whom the Lord loves, he corrects. When we sin, when we step into the devil's domain, we have a loving heavenly father who will faithfully correct us. Hebrews 12, 6 declares, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every child of God whom he receives. That may sound severe, but it's God's way of disciplining and protecting us. We parents would much rather take the punishment ourselves, yet out of love we know that we must discipline our children for their own good. A great preacher once said, to be very dear to God involves no small degree of continual correction. He just can't allow a man or a woman of God to be sloppy and careless. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 6 declares, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For the Lord disciplines whom he loves, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So divine discipline is just necessary in our lives. It refines us and indicates that God is directing and watching over us. The means of God's discipline can be afflictions, persecutions, and trials. God rebukes us to expose our faults so we might acknowledge them and repent. That happened to King David when he was boldly rebuked by the prophet Nathan for stealing another man's wife. That narrative is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to tell David a parable that there were two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had loads of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had only one little ewe lamb. It grew up in his family, sharing his food and even drinking from his cup. The little lamb slept in his arms and was cherished like a daughter. Now a traveler visited the rich man who who greedily took the poor man's lamb, killed it, and served it for his guest rather than preparing food from his own huge flocks. Well, when King David heard that, he burned with anger. And he said, as surely as the Lord lives, that man deserves to die. Then Nathan boldly said, you are the man. And King David was stunned, but he immediately acknowledged his sin, and tragically, there would be consequences. The Lord, the God of Israel, said, I anointed you king over Israel, but you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite and had him killed. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. And sure enough, internal strife and violence came to David's household. So God greatly disciplined him. However, it has to be said that trials are not always sent by God, as in the case of Job in the Bible. Satan was the instigator, and he can be behind many of our troubles, and we need to learn to discern 
the difference. One of the scariest things on earth is making the cross of the Savior in this dangerous hour of no effect. But Hebrews 10.29 asks, How much more severely do you think one deserves to be punished who has trampled on the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and insulted the Spirit of grace? You see, the blood sacrifices offered under the law in the days of the Hebrew Scriptures were sacred with real cleansing power. How much more intensely holy and sacred must be the blood of the Messiah, the Son of God. The power of the blood of Jesus is more powerful than the blood of the Passover lamb or the temple sacrifices. The blood of animals brought freedom to the Israelites from slavery, but the blood of Messiah is superior and grants us not only deliverance from sin, but also eternal life. Think about that. So what are we going to do with the blood of Messiah? Will you dangerously reject Jesus in the cross? Or will you be wise and embrace the benefits of the cross? His death procured for us the priceless benefits of forgiveness of all of our sins, healing of our diseases, and eternal life. You see, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Yeshua, is neither a myth or a fable. His resurrection was witnessed by people who touched him, examined him, and testified to his resurrection. So urgently, I must encourage you to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, the world's only Savior, while there's still time. The great unchurched masses, tragically, have no real understanding and education about the world's need of the Savior. And if you don't perceive your own need of repentance and redemption, that's a dangerous, deceptive place to be. Thankfully, the door of salvation is still open and there's still room for you to humble yourself at the foot of the cross. By faith right now, I invite you to come with me to the cross of Jesus to receive forgiveness and the free gift of eternal life. Amen. Now today I want to leave you with Revelation 22:11, a prophecy concerning men's hearts at the end of the age. It says, let the evildoer continue to be evil and the vile continue to be vile. Let the righteous continue to practice righteousness and the holy continue to be holy. Well, I encourage you to visit our website, exploits.tv and our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site to watch our library of videos anytime, 24-7. Daniel 11.32 declares that the people who know their God will be strong, not weak, and we're going to carry out exploits, meaning we'll accomplish the works of the Lord in the remaining time before the Lord's imminent return. Please download our free Jerusalem Channel app. And if you have any questions, contact me at exploits.tv or on social media. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom. I'm Christine Darg. Maranatha. When you visit the Jerusalem Channel website, you can watch all our videos with closed caption subtitles. Select the closed caption logo at the bottom right corner of the video screen and select English. Jerusalem Channel Facebook page, you can select closed captions in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic. The Jerusalem Channel YouTube site has closed captions in English.